Good afternoon. So as requested by my student, I will go first to module number three and module number four. And then we'll go back to section 2.2 in binary subtractors after discussing module three and module number four. Module number three is about sequential, synchronous sequential logic. In this module, we will discuss sections 3.1 to 3.4. For 3.1, it will be about sequential circuits in general. Then 3.2 will be about storage elements such as latches and flip-flops. For 3.3, will be about analysis of clock sequential circuits and then 3.4 we'll try to model the sequential circuits with Verilog HDL it's introduction <coughs> Excuse. the digital circuits considered thus far have been combinational so all those previous circuits that we have been discussing so far were examples of combinational circuits where their output depends only and immediately on their inputs and they have no memory elements that is dependence they are they are dependent only on the past values of their input while for sequential circuits, they act as storage elements and have memory. They can store, retain, and then retrieve information when needed at a later time. Our objective in this module is to define sequential circuits and then differentiate it from combinational circuits and then give examples of sequential circuits this is the block diagram of a sequential circuit it has all those it has the form of a combination combinational circuit with another block for the memory elements and this memory elements has a feedback path towards the combinational circuit part of the sequential circuit. We have here a sequential circuit consists of a combinational circuit to which storage elements are connected to form a feedback path. The storage elements, these are devices capable of storing binary information. The binary information stored in these elements at any given time defines the state of the sequential circuit at that time. So we have this what we call state. Outputs in sequential circuits are a function not only of the inputs but also of the present state of the storage elements. Since we, since we have said that sequential circuits have memory, then there is a present state and there is present and then the past, past state. Sequential circuit is specified by a time sequence of inputs, outputs, and internal states. In contrast, the outputs of the combinational logic depends only on the present values of the inputs. This will be clearer with an example later on. There are two main types of sequential circuits, synchronous and then asynchronous. For synchronous, 
the behavior can be defined from the knowledge of its signals at discrete instants of time. For asynchronous, it depends upon the input signals at any instant at time and the order in which the inputs change. It's kind of vague, the de uh, definitions. So what is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? We um, this will be clearer to understand the difference between synchronous and asynchronous if we have an example circuit or an HDL code but in my own words synchronous this uses a clock signal both are types of sequential circuits so they have memory both have memory elements but for synchronous we use a clock signal to synchronize all those sequential signals so we use a clock signal and those sequential signals will Synchronous sequential signals will depend on the clock and the ordering and how we place those signals in our code, Verilog code, doesn't matter because they will depend only on the clock signal. For asynchronous, they, for asynchronous signals, they are still considered sequential, part of the sequential circuit because they have they are stored in memory elements probably registers and they don't depend on the clock there's no single synchronizing clock for all of those signals so that's why the order in which the input change is important for synchronous sequential circuits synchronization is achieved by a timing device called a clock generator that's what I've said there's a clock signal that will synchronize the signals in the sequential circuit synchronous sequential circuit which provides a clock signal having the form of a periodic train of clock pulses Synchronous sequential circuits are also called clocked sequential circuits. This is the block diagram, of block diagram and the timing diagram of cl synchronous clocked sequential circuits. Notice from the block diagram, the memory elements are replaced with flip-flops. And one of the inputs of this flip-flops is the clock pulses from the clock generator. This is the timing diagram of the clock pulses, which is just a periodic train of clock pulses. So they have fixed frequency or time interval. which will synchronize the other synchronous sequential circuit, uh, signals. Flip-flop, this is the storage element or memory used in clock sequential circuits. This is a binary storage device capable of storing one bit of information. So a flip-flop, a single flip-flop can store one bit of information. The outputs are formed by a combinational logic function of the inputs to the circuit. Or the values stored in the flip-flops are both. The outputs are formed by a combinational logic function. That is for a sequential, synchronous sequential circuit. The new value is stored, that is, the flip-flop is updated 
when a pulse of the clock signal occurs. Prior to the occurrence of the clock pulse, the combinational logic forming the next value of the fifth flop must have reached a stable value. Consequently, the speed at which the combinational logic circuit operates is critical. So, when will the value stored in the flip flop change or is to be updated? It's it's in every clock pulse. So, for example, if we set in our code that it depends on how we set it in our code, the common is in the rising edge or the falling edge of the clock. So, if we set in our code that the value in the flip flop will be updated for every rising edge, then it will change here in this part here at the rising edge of the clock or if we set in our code that it will change in the falling edge of the clock then the value the stored value in the flip flop will change every falling edge of the clock But we must make sure that during that time, the signal from the combinational circuit is already stable because whatever is passed to the flip-flop during that rising edge or falling edge, that is the value that will be stored inside the flip-flop. That's why the speed at which the combinational logic circuit operates is critical. Propagation delay plays an important role in determining the minimum interval between clock pulses that will allow the circuit to operate correctly. Thus, the transition from one state to the next occurs only at predetermined intervals dictated by the clock pulses. So that's the simple explanation on synchronous sequential circuits let's go to 3.2 about storage elements the latches and flip-flops a storage element in a digital circuit can maintain a binary state indefinitely as long as power is still de delivered to the circuit until directed by an input signal to switch states Storage elements that operate with signal levels rather than signal transitions are referred to as latches. Those controlled by a clock transition are flip-flops. This section will discuss about latches and flip-flops in sequential circuits. So what are the two basic types of storage elements used? In sequential circuits, we have the latches and flip-flops. Let's differentiate the two. For latches, these are, le these are level sensitive devices. While for flip flop, this is an edge sensitive device. Latches are useful for storing binary information and for the design of asynchronous sequential circuits. While for flip flops, so our storage elements in synchronous sequential circuits. Latches are the building blocks of flip flops. Is it clear already the difference between flip flops and latches? Let's try to, for example, we know that in the sequential circuits, whether synchronous or asynchronous, we have a clock signal that will control 
the other, the change in our storage elements. For the flip-flop, for the flip-flop, our control element is the clock. And it will change, let's draw here the flip-flop. One of the inputs is the clock. Surface flip-flop. Let's call this an A flip-flop. Our A flip-flop with an output A. The output A will change or be updated every time the clock changes uh, every time the clock is on its positive rising edge this edge this edge and it occurs periodically if we set in our code that this is updated every rising edge of the clock for the latch however Call this latch B. We have an input, and then we have our should we call it clock? The synchronize the asynchronous signal. Okay, let's just call it clock. But however, this clock will become asynchronous. Let's not call it clock. Now. Let's call it asynchronous. Asynchronous signal in for enable. Enable signal. Unlike the clock. This can have irregular interval. So if this is, if we declare this latch to change when enable is 1 or when enable is high, then the value of the latch stored in the latch will be updated every time the enable is 1. So this part here, not on the rising edge, but every time enable is 1. Or you can also, we can also declare in our code that the latch, in our code or in our logic diagram, that the latch will change value or be updated the value of the value stored in the latch B will be updated if our enable is zero then B will be updated during this instances when enable is zero so it's level sensitive it's either enable is one or enable zero as opposed to a flip-flop which is edge sensitive where the flip-flop depends on the rising edge or the falling edge of the clock instead of whether it is high or low and the flip-flops are usually used in synchronous sequential circuits while latches are what seldom used however latches are the building blocks of 
Verbs. We have examples of latches, the SR latch, and then the D latch. SR latch, this is a circuit with two cross coupled NOR gate or two cross coupled NAND gates and two inputs labeled S for set and R for reset. This is the block diagram of the SR latch with NAND gates. So we have here the cross couple. Our inputs are S and R for set and reset. And then the output is Q and Q prime. The SR latch with NOR gates and then the SR latch with NAND gates. Let's look at the functional table, function table, truth table. The output Q is 1. If the output Q is 1, if S is 1, or S is the set, signal is 1, so Q is 1. Or both set and reset are zero, but after that is after s is equal to one or r is equal to zero. Meaning if our previous state is in the set state where we previously set the output by assigning 1 to s if we change s from 1 to 0 and r remains at 0 0 then the output does not change or is still at q is equal to 1 it will only go to 0 if s is 0 and then we press r or we put R to be equal to 1 or this is our reset input if we make our reset input equal to 1 while the S is 0 then it will reset the output meaning it will set Q equal to 0 the complement of that Q prime is equal to 1 and then the output will still be at 0 and 1 it will remain at this output even if we change the R signal from 1 to 0 as long as our S or set is still at 0 what is forbidden is if our S and R signal are both 1 our Q and Q prime is at 0 0 but we should avoid this condition where S and R set and reset are both 1 so it should be 1 at a time it's like pressing a button where you press S or R but not both to set or reset our output that is the function table for the SR latch using neural gates and this is the block diagram or logic diagram so can you analyze the logic diagram given the function table do they match let's try to analyze the logic diagram Let's start with S and R equal to 0 when both are 0 and then we press set so we press set so this becomes 1 and what is Q at that time we should have an initial condition so let's say that the out Output is Q is 0 we are from reset so output Q is 0 and then we try to set the input 
So zero and then one. We or that so the answer is the result is one and then we invert so q prime is zero. Zero. Then reset is zero. Zero zero. We or that the result is zero and then we invert. The result is one. Therefore, if we set, if initially this, the circuit is in reset with Q is equal to 0 and then we press 1 for set or we assign S is equal to 1. Q, the result will make Q our output equal to 1. So correct. We have reached this second line here, where we are, where we are able. I know, we have reached this first line here, first row, where we are able to set Q equal to one by pressing S equal to one, with R equal to zero and our initial state of the circuit is from reset, which is Q is equal to zero. and so on for the NAND gate do they have the same truth table different So here instead, when we set the signal, instead of Q is equal to 1, Q becomes 0. And then the forbidden state is when both S and R are 0. Since we are using NAND gates instead of NOR gates. For this, our latch with NOR gates. Yes, yeah, so we have already discussed this one. The set state is when S equals 1 and R equals 0, and Q equals 1, and Q prime equals 0 per our output. Reset state is when S equals 0 and R equals 1, and Q equals 0 and Q prime equals 1. Q and Q prime are normally complement of each other. When both inputs are equal to 1 at the same time, a condition in which both outputs are equal to 0 rather than be mutually complemented occurs. If both inputs are then switched to 0 simultaneously, the device will enter an unpredictable or undefined state or a metastable state. Consequently, in practical applications, setting both inputs to 1 is forbidden. For the NOR gates, for the SR latch with NAND gates, The opposite, we already discussed this. So I'll just read this part here. Let's go now to the G latch. We're done with the SR latch with NOR gates and NAND gates. Let's go to the D latch, which is also called transparent latch. D latch eliminates the undesirable condition of the indeterminate state in the SR latch. This ensures that inputs S and R are never equal to 1 at the same time so that we can avoid that forbidden state or metastable state. So what is the block diagram of the d -Latch? Here we have 5 gates instead of 2. The SR latch have two gates it has two gates while the d latch has five we have here the logic diagram of the d latch with four NAND gates and one inverter or we can consider this inverter in NAND gate so we can have five NAND gates for the function table 
if our enable signal is zero then the output does not change because we there does not enable the tlh but if our enable is one what happens enable and dr input so if enable is one or rd and our d input is zero then our q is equal to zero if d is one then q is one as simple as that as long as the enable is equal to one the output q will follow whatever the value of d is and q prime will always be the complement of q So let's try to analyze this dlatch. Why do we have to add more logic gates here instead of just using AND gates with enable? Why not just use an AND gate with an enable here and a D input? For the Q and then just write an inverter add an inverter for Q prime why here if our enable is zero and our d is zero then our q is zero and then if enable is one and d is zero our q is zero then if enable is one And our D is 1, our Q is 1, this is 0. So whatever the value of D, if our enable is 0, the output is always 0. So we have not stored anything here. If we use this combinational circuit, we are not storing the previous value of Q because the value will always be zero. But if we have this circuit for the D latch, if our enable is zero, the Q output depends on the previous Q value not on the present value of d so if enable is zero the output can either be one or zero of q depending on the past value of q that's how the d latch works the d input goes directly to the s input and its complement is applied to the r input as long as the enable input is zero, the cross coupled SR latch. This part here has both inputs at the one level, and the circuit cannot change state regardless of the value of D. Graphic symbols for latches. This is the graphic symbol for the SR latch. We have two inputs S and R, and then the output and the complement. SR latch with bar on top means that the inputs are complemented. We have two bubbles here, then same output QQ prime. For the D latch, we have the D input, <coughs> excuse, and then the enable input, same outputs Q and QQ prime. Bubbles are added to the inputs to indicate that setting and resetting occurs with a 
logic zero signal. So we're done with latches. Let's go to the storage elements. Another storage element, the flip flop. We have this term trigger. Trigger is the transition causing change in control input. The delatch with pauses and its control input is essentially a flip-flop that is triggered every time the pause goes to the logic 1 level. So for the delatch, the trigger is the logic level 1. If the pause goes to logic level 1, the delatch will be activated or will be triggered clock response in latch and flip flop so we have here the comparison response to positive level there is positive edge response and then C is negative edge response B and C, these are for flip-flops, while A is the trigger for the latches. A clock, pulse goes through trans A clock pulse goes through two transitions from 0 to 1. It's like here from as shown in letter B. And then return from 1 to 0. Letter C for the negative edge response. The positive transition is defined as the positive edge and the negative transition as the negative edge. Master slave D flip flop. The diagram is shown in figure 5.9. There are two latches, D latches. And the first is called the master, and the second is called the slave. So this is an example of the block diagram of a D flip flop. It's a D flip flop with two D latches and an inverter. We know that latches are the building blocks of flip-flops and flip-flops have clock inputs figure 5.9 flip-flop is negative edge triggered thus a change in the input of the flip-flop can be triggered only by ensuring the transition of the clock from 1 to 0 if it's negative edge triggered, we know that the transition is from 1 to 0. That's why the flip flop is triggered on the flip flop is triggered during transition of the clock from high to low or 1 to 0. For the behavior of the flip flop in figure 5.9 First, the output may change only once, and that is only during the trigger. That is only during when the latch or the flip flop is triggered. A change in the output is triggered by the negative edge of the clock, since this is a negative edge triggered flip flop. And the change may occur only during the clock's negative level. Okay. To create a positive edge triggered flop, add an inverter to the clock lines. So if you want this negative edge triggered flop to be a positive edge triggered, let's just add an inverter in this part. Edge trigger diff flip flop uses three SR 
latches. This is how we implement the type positive edge triggered flip flop. Two latches for the positive edge triggered we use three latches first second and third as compared to the negative edge triggered which we use where we used only two two latches respond to the external d the data and clock inputs the third latch provides the outputs for the flip-flops so see the book for more detailed explanation. The timing of the response of a flip flop to input data and to the clock must be taken into consideration when one is using edge triggered flip flops. That's why we have these terminologies. We have to define these terminologies that are related to the timing of the flip-flop. We have the setup time. This is the minimum time during which the D input must be maintained at a constant value prior to the occurrence of the clock transition. Now we have to make sure that the signal, the data is stable before we sample or we trigger the clock. And we have this parameter called setup time. This is the minimum time during which the D input must be maintained. So we have to maintain the D input. The D input must be stable for the for the minimum time, which we call the setup time. Before we sample data using the clock before we trigger the flip-flop then hold time this is the minimum time during which the D input must not change so after triggering the clock our data must again still be stable during a minimum time called the hold time after the application of the pos positive transition of so we have the setup time before triggering the clock or the rising edge of the clock and then hold time after the rising edge of the clock and then we have propagation delay this is the interval between the trigger edge and the stabilization of the output to a new state interval between the trigger edge the stabilization and the output okay these are uh, this and other parameters are specified in the manufacturer's data books for specific logic families so these are provided by these parameters characteristics of the standard cells are provided by the companies offering those Offering the package containing the standard cells that we that will be used for the design of the digital circuits. Arrowhead-like symbols in front of the letter clock designating a dynamic input. So this this triangular shape or arrowhead signifies that this is a dynamic input. Our clock is a dynamic input. The fact that the flip flop responds to the edge transition of the clock. That's why flip flops have this triangular shape here, which means that we are the flip flop is responding to the edge transition of the clock. 
A bubble outside the block adjacent to the dynamic indicator designates a negative edge for triggering the circuit. For positive edge, there's no bubble outside the clock. For negative edge, we have this small bubble before the tri uh, triangular symbol. Before the dynamic indicator. Other flip flops aside from this, aside from the D latch, we also have and a D latch. Aside from the D flip flop, we have other types of flip flops. The J key flip flop. This is the characteristic table or function table of a J key flip flop. Two inputs and performs all three operations of set, reset, and complement. So, uh, aside from set and reset, which is available for the D flip flop, Jake flip flop has another feature, which is the complement. If J is one, then Q is one, so it is in the set state. And J is 0 and K is 1, then this reset, it is in reset state. When J and 1 are both 1, then we perform the complement. We are complementing the output, the previous output. And with j and k equal to 0, the output will not change state. For the t or toggle flip-flop, this is a complementing flip-flop and can be obtained from a j key flip-flop when inputs j and k are tied together. So it is the t flip-flop is just from the j key flip-flop. So if we tie it together, both inputs j and k so we are only using this two functionalities no change and complement since j and k must be equal all the time so no change or complement for the t flip flop it's the characteristic table of the flip flop for the d set and reset for the t flip flop change no change and complement characteristic equations let's go to the characteristic equations of the flip-flops different types of flip-flops for the d flip-flop q of t plus one equals d this only means that the next state of the output, which is Q of T plus 1, will be equal to the value of the input T in the present state. For the... Let me just correct myself for saying the past state and the present state. It's Instead, it is the present state and the next state. For the GK flip-flop, Q of t plus 1 is equal to jq prime plus k prime q. So the next state of the output is equal to the input j and the complement of the present state of the output plus the complement of k which is another input ended with the present state of the output q for the t flip flop the next state of the output is equal to exclusive or uh, between t our input t and the output present state of the output q or this is equal to 
d q prime plus d prime q. Direct inputs. Some flip flops have asynchronous inputs that are used to force the flip flop to a particular state independently of the clock. For example, uh, that is preset or direct set and clear or direct reset. So aside from the clock, we have other inputs that can we have other asynchronous inputs that can override our clock for example for a positive edge trigger the flip-flop we know that this is the block diagram of the positive edge trigger the flip-flop it has three latches SR latches then aside from the clock we have added the second or we have added the reset signal therefore some of the logic gates here some of the NAND gates are having three inputs instead of two it has a reset input asynchronous input here asynchronous reset this is the block diagram of the fifth flop with a synchronous reset. I mean the graphic symbol, not the block diagram, the graphic symbol. Uh, yeah, some of the block diagram. The graphic symbol of the fifth flop. Does D input the data, then clock is connected to this clock input of the fifth flop. This is a positive edge triggered flip flop because there's no bubble here. And this is a synchronous reset which is activated when reset is equal to zero as indicated by this bubble. Let's check the function table. When reset is one yeah, when you set this one, the circuit, the flip flop operates normally with the clock. The output is zero and D equals zero during the positive edge of the clock. And one, Q is one when D is one for the positive edge of the clock when R is one because reset is deactivated or is not triggered, not enabled. We know that reset function is enabled when R is 0. So if R is 0, whatever the inputs from the D or the clock is, the output is always in reset, which is equal to 0. So we're done with latches and flip-flops. Review latch and flip flops store bit of information in logic circuits. Latches are asynchronous sequential circuits, while flip flops are synchronous. Then latches can be SR or D latch, while flip flops can be D flip flop, JK flip flop, and T flip flop. Let's go to 3.3, .3, which is the analysis of clock sequential circuits. Introduction. The behavior of a clock sequential circuit is determined from the inputs, the outputs, and the state of the flip-flops. The outputs and the next state are both function of the inputs and the present state. The outputs in the next state depends on the inputs and the present state. So let's discuss and analyze the behavior of clock sequential circuits. So let's just continue this on our next video. 
Thank you for watching and please subscribe.